Kalani Sitake hired Jay Hill as his defensive coordinator with the whole goal of revamping BYU's defense and getting it to truly compete at a power four level. After what I've observed early on in training camp, maybe, just maybe, the Cougars are finally getting it. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen and or view of the day. And a big thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us right here on your original daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Of course, all summer long, FanDuel is looking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everybody every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started today. All right. Day five, BYU training camp is in the books. We had a chance as a media conglomerate to watch about 20 minutes of practice yesterday. And based on the comments that Kalani Sitake had to say to us after practice as well, as what we observed in that media observation window, BYU's defense is bowling out right now, folks. The biggest thing to take away, I feel like, is that after about a year of working with Jay Hill, no, it's been a year, it's been a year plus, Jay Hill's philosophy, his install of what he has envisioned for BYU's defense, what he hopes to accomplish overall with Brigham Young University, it appears to finally be coming into focus. Let me take you back to the early years of Bronco Mendenhall's tenure just for a moment. Bronco Mendenhall is fond of saying that he, quote unquote, did not know what he was doing in his first year as BYU football head coach. Remember, that was 2005. BYU ground out a six and six record, uh, made their first appearance in the Las Vegas Bowl after three years of missing out on bowl games. And Bronco essentially described it as him trying to essentially put everything together he needed to do as a very young head coach. I'm not trying to compare the early years of Bronco Mendenhall's head coaching tenure to Jay Hill because Jay is about as tenured a head coach now turned defensive coordinator as you're going to find. But there is a term in college football that is often used with new coaches coming into situations where they have to make wholesale changes and to use the house building analogy, tear everything down to the foundation and build it back up. The colloquial term out there is year zero. There will be multiple times you will see that when talking about head coaches who have come into situations uh, with a program that's fallen on hard times, they will get what they call a year zero, where they essentially just tear everything up, tear up every footing, foundation, and go back to literally the beginning and building up their program the way that they want to see it built. Now, Sometimes it pays off in spades. Other times it fails spectacularly, and two or three years later, they're out of a job once again. Jay Hill, I think, went through his year zero last year with the BYU defense. Remember, the metrics for BYU's defense a year ago were, quite frankly, atrocious. Sub 100 in many categories. I think second or dead last in sacks. The worst uh, sack uh, team in the Power 5 then ranked, now Power 4 ranks by far. It was not a good season overall for the BYU defense. And obviously Jay went about retooling things. They had a very, very strong recruiting class. Speaking of the BYU defense this past go round, he talked about that on Friday saying that a number of the freshmen have shown out in training camp so far. I can tell you based on my observations, guys like Trey Allen. Alexander, Jonathan Cabea, Ephraim Asiata, uh, who else? Uh, Celia Sarah, if you want to count him, you can. He's a redshirt freshman. But there's a lot of young, uh, Fala Tausa Tuala, Tommy Prassis. Man, there's a lot of names that come to mind. Uh, Kini Lau or Kini Fonohema. A lot of these freshmen are pushing for time with the threes and the twos right now in training camp. And that's a positive sign. They're unseating veteran players who have been in those positions previously and essentially forcing their way into the conversation for playing time this fall. I think that last year, Jay Hill said, you know what? We're going to take our lumps. We're going to install this defense. We're going to teach the basic rudimentary concepts of it to these players. And we're going to try and get by with what we've got. Yet again, I reiterate, BYU's numbers last year were not pretty. But what I have seen so far in training camp and the conversations I've had with our practice insiders who see far more than 20 minutes that I see on uh, the opportunity, the days we get to go out there. I'm talking about people that I know they're there every single day watching the entirety of practice. 
there is a newfound optimism. This BYU defense, it finally is starting to turn that proverbial corner under Jay Hill's leadership. And I'm I'm not saying it's going to be a top tier Big 12 defense this fall, but could it climb into the top half of the conference? I think that is a goal that is attainable for this BYU defense. Now, are there pieces still missing? Absolutely. I am still massively concerned about the overall depth and talent base that BYU has, particularly up front on the defensive line. I think the linebacking core has uh, proven itself. It's got some fairly good pieces there. I think on the back end, uh, so long as the secondary looks the way it looks right now, and they have some health finally, because remember the safety position last year was just absolutely decimated due to injury. With some luck in terms of the injury uh, bug, and also, I think guys really understanding what it, they need to do in this defense to have success combined. There's one un underrated element. If you uh, listen to Jay Hill's comments last Friday, is that multiple guys have put up massive game gains in the strength and conditioning department. He talked about guys like John Nelson and other defensive linemen who have had 30 plus pounds to their max uh, weight lifting benches and the like. Those strength numbers. That's absolutely astounding, especially for upperclassmen, because you think they've been through years and years worth of training. But it's a credit to Ryan Phyllis as BYU strength and conditioning coach, overhauling the whole strength and conditioning uh, philosophy. And if everything comes together, and it's a crapshoot, obviously, because we haven't seen it on the field, and we're still a ways away from the start of the football season. It's day five of BYU training camp. But there is optimism among folks who have got a far more vested interest than myself. Remember, I'm a podcaster. I'm a, I'm a sports radio professional. I'm paid, as we like to say in sports radio, to second guess people. I don't first guess. First guess is for Jay Hill. He has to first guess who he's going to put on the field in certain combinations. I second guess Jay Hill's decisions. That's that's my job as a sports media pundit. But there is optimism among folks who are those quote unquote first guessers or people involved with the BYU football program that maybe, just maybe, this is truly going to be the season you start to see Jay Hill really resurrect this BYU defense. It was not good for long stretches of the last season. And it was a big reason why BYU finished the year two and seven overall with a five game losing streak uh, to finish out the campaign going five and seven. If this defense can make some strides, and I'm not saying they need to go from zero to hero. They don't have to go from 16th in the league uh, to potentially number one. But if you can find yourself in that top eight in the league in terms of the defensive metrics and in, at the end of the year, I think that would go a long way to helping BYU get to that six and six mark or even beyond that this season. TBD, I don't know if it really comes to fruition, but the early returns in training camp are very very positive based on the people I have talked to and what I'm hearing just with my own ears and seeing with my own eyes as I'm out there at practice. But it's a, it's a good thing to have. It's a good problem to have as it were for Jay Hill. And maybe just maybe he went through that year zero last year has come out the other side and BYU's defense is going to be all the better for it as they push forward on into their big 12 future. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk about four guys that I think have been shining early on in training camp. A little bit off the beaten track names, one of which I had uh, almost kind of written off completely in terms of his opportunity to, I, that I felt like in terms of his ability to contribute to BYU in any meaningful way in the remaining time he had with the Cougars. But he's had a bit of a resurgence so far in training camp. Who are they? We'll dig into those next as we roll on right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Now, all summer long, FanDuel is here for you guys, no matter what you might be into. If you're watching the Olympics over there in Paris, I have been absolutely enthralled with multiple disciplines when it comes to the Olympic Games. Or if you're an, a, a midsummer classic type guy where baseball is your bread and butter, no matter what you're into, FanDuel's there for you guys. You can go on their app every time you want and drew up any bets anytime you're in the mood all summer long. And the best part is all summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. So if you think of something you're like, hey, you know what? I want to put some money down on that. FanDuel's probably got a booster bonus to help you incentivize you to make that bet today. That's right. There's something for everybody every day all summer long. Take advantage today and visit FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. There's not a lot of time left. And I know that school's starting back up here for our, for our kids. But regardless, you can have some fun with our friends at FanDuel, bet on futures odds when it comes to the NFL or college football or for BYU, no matter what you're into, get over to FanDuel.com and have some fun today. And it's all courtesy of your friends over at FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. 
Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. For your second listen, enjoy the Locked On uh, Locked On Cougars. You're listening to Locked On Cougars or watching Locked On Cougars. Make sure you check out the Locked On College Football Podcast. Spencer McLaughlin gets you ready for an exciting season on the gridiron with discussion on the upcoming season, the ever-changing landscape, uh, landscape of college athletics, including conference realignment, the transfer portal, NIL, new college football expanded playoff, and more. It's Locked On College Football, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, and it's all part of the Locked On Podcast network your team every day all right so i mentioned there are four guys that i have seen through the first five now today will be day six of byu training camp that i think have uh really had nice showing so far will it translate where they see extended time this fall that is obviously something that we'll have to gauge in the future but they are four names that i absolutely think so far in training camp might be the unsung stars and some of them are probably getting some pub in other publications or other podcasts but they're the four names that i wanted to talk about today and we're going to start off on the offensive side of the football i mentioned in my tease that there was a guy that i had essentially written off thinking you know what he's probably had his time in the sun it's just not going to come to fruition for him that guy Ethan Erickson. Yeah, that may sound like a blast from the past for some of you who are uh, our most loyal listeners. Deep cut there. A guy, remember, when he came in off of a mission, he uh, played at Kahuku High School in Hawaii. Uh, six foot five, 230 pounds, looked every bit the part of uh, just one of those tight ends that BYU routinely had brought in in their history that had success in BYU's offense. Well, early on in his career, it looked like he was that quote unquote era parent. To Isaac Rex. I remember Aaron Roderick in multiple media sessions saying that this kid has got all the tools to be the next star tight end for us at BYU. Now, what happened? Well, injuries happened. Ethan spent essentially all of last year, I think even beyond that, maybe it's been about a year and a half now, that he has dealt with numerous injury concerns. He is back out there in training camp right now. And I'm telling you, I keep looking at the tight end group and I see this number 87 running down the field. I'm like, cool, hold on. I've got my roster right here, actually. I can pull it up right as we're talking on the podcast. And I keep looking at my roster like, okay, 87, 87. Oh, Ethan Erickson. He keeps running. He keeps getting opportunities with the first string offense. I know we've talked a lot about with the tight ends for Keanu Hill. Reiner Swanson, who was a guest on this podcast just yesterday. If you missed that conversation, go back and listen to it. I, I love Reiner. He's a great chat with that young man. You can tell he's highly motivated to contribute as a true freshman. But as it stands, Ethan Erickson, now he's listed as a redshirt junior, so he's been in the program for four years now for the BYU football program. But keep an eye on Ethan Erickson. 87, get to know that number because I'm telling you, he is running with the ones more often than I fully anticipated. He adds critical depth to a tight end unit. I think he's got a lot of depth to begin with because I think Mata Avataase, Jackson Bowers, um, Ray Paulo, along with the aforementioned Keanu Hill, Reiner Swanson, Anthony Olsen also in that mix. There's a lot of bodies in that tight end unit. And Aaron Roderick said they, could, uh, they will travel as many as six, maybe eight tight ends with the travel squad this year. That is really cool to see, but Ethan Erickson, man, I, I'm stunned. Like, like I said, I kind of had written him off with those injuries, thinking eh, maybe it's his time has passed him by. Apparently not, and he looks polished right now. His body looks good. He looks fully healthy, and here's to a good run for him health-wise because he deserves it. Flipping over to the defense, Sione Moa. Now, those of you who are in our Locked On Cougars Insider Group, a shameless plug to join us. I'm sending you guys updates via text message when I'm out there at practice. Uh, as soon as practice wraps up, I'm filling, in, filling you in on everything I'm writing down uh, on my notes. And Sione Moa has shown up in my notes every day we've been at training camp so far. We've been out there for three days, and every day I've written down Sione Moa's name. Now, Isaiah Moa was a star player in high school that BYU picked up as a four-star prospect. It hasn't really worked to this point with Ice. Ice is uh, making the transition to linebacker this year, but Sione Moa was a transfer from Utah State last year who was, I think, pretty lightly thought of in terms of his ability to contribute to BYU football. I'm telling you, so far in training camp, Sione Moa is one of the most impressive, if not the most impressive linebacker, not named Ciala Acera for my money. Siala Sarah is a household name at this point. I think Siala is on his way to starting for BYU, likely in that spot that Ben Bywater is vacated now that he is medically retired. But do not be surprised to see number 41 Sione Moa playing this fall. He has shown a really, really nice ability to shed blocks and make tackles in the backfield. I know they're not going fully to the ground right now in training camp, but the thud drills, he's showing well. In a three-play sequence yesterday, and I feel bad for McKay Hillstead in this sequence because McKay Hillstead had a fumbled snap that was uh, picked up, an interception by Sione Moa, and then essentially had the ball. He dropped back to pass and uh, 
cocked his arm back to throw it down the field and the ball popped out of his hand. It was wet. The rain had come through and the ball popped out and guess who pounced on it? Sione Moa. Sione Moa is shown to be a playmaker. So uh, don't be surprised to see if he uh, makes some noise this fall. And I'll tell you, I've been told by his family, speaking of Sione Moa's family, going back as uh, far as last December to keep an eye out for him. And he's making good on what they told me about him. Sticking with the defense. Next guy up, Maury Bamba. Now, coming into training camp, Maury was a guy that, remember, when he came in from the junior college ranks, he was six foot three, 180 pounds, ran like a deer, and it felt like, okay, He's got all the physical tools to be a, an impact corner because you can't teach six foot three as a cornerback and have four 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 three speed that he uh, reportedly boasted coming into BYU. It never really has come to fruition so far for Maury Bamba. And there was a lot of thought going into training camp that it was Jacob Robinson and Mark Collins who are probably going to be the starting cornerback tandem for BYU. Well, so far in training camp, Maury Bamba has been the guy opposite Jacob Robinson at the outside corner spot. That's the impressive part about this. Maury still boasts that elite size. He said he packed on. I think I had a conversation with him. We're going to play later this week. I have to edit it up a little bit because I had a bit of a glitch with the rain going on. So I'll have to work on that. But Maury has said he has gained about 15 pounds. He looks like he's filled his frame out a little bit more. But he also pointed to the fact that Gennaro Guilford, as BYU's cornerbacks coach, has been critical to getting him up to speed to contribute for BYU right now. So, Keep an eye on Mori Bamba. He is finally, I think, coming into his own and at long last in many respects because maury has been here. I think he said he's been, this is his fourth year with the program. Uh, and it's crazy to think it's been that long already. But if he can finally uh, pay off, uh, I, to use that term, in terms of contributing on the field, potentially as a starting, starting uh, corner for the BYU defense, I think that would be a really, really cool story because he has stuck with it through a lot of things. Injury concerns, uh, all kinds of stuff that he has dealt with during his time at BYU, but it's cool to see him getting his opportunity. Now, uh, Mark Collins, as I understand, has not been fully healthy all the way through training camp yet, so uh, he's been limited in terms of his availability to contribute for BYU's defense. So I think it's still very much a battle uh, for that corner job opposite Jacob Robinson, but right now, it's Maury Bomba's job to lose, and we'll see if he can hold on to it throughout the remainder of training camp. All right, the final guy I want to talk about on today's show in terms of guys that have stood out to me is flipping back over to the offense for a minute. Now, this is a name that is going to probably cause some of your heads to explode. Caleb Etienne. Yes, the guy who looked just completely lost at multiple points last season. Yes, I know that it may, you're like, what are you talking about, Jake? You were as critical on him as almost anybody was, and I freely admit I was hypercritical at times of BYU continuing to put uh, Caleb Etienne out there in a situation where it felt like it was just an abject failure. What I have been told, what I have seen, what I have just absolutely uh, enjoyed about Caleb Etienne this fall is he looks and sounds like a completely different player. He's back at left tackle for BYU. There's a lot of people that thought that Braden Kime was going to kick over from right tackle to left tackle. Caleb Etienne said, no, that's my, that's my spot. And he looks at home playing left tackle. BYU's had a really, really good run of late with their left tackle. Think about it, Brady Christensen, Blake Freeland, Kingsley Suomataia. All of them are now in the NFL. I'm not saying that they're going to go four for four now because that seems like it's still a ways off to see if Caleb Etienne can really accomplish that. But he looks and sounds like a whole new player. And people around the program have expressed optimism that he is finally comfortable with what BYU is trying to run. He's not lost seemingly on every play out there. What I have observed watching him during the observation windows is this is a person, speaking of Caleb Etienne, who looks so much more comfortable doing what he's doing doing within the BYU offense. It took some time. It's taken a long time uh, for him to really uh, kind of get uh, in and get ingrained with this BYU offense. But what a cool story that would be. Remember, this is a guy that routinely was missing blocks and looked completely lost on the field last season. What if that guy ended up becoming one of BYU's better offensive linemen this year? What a comeback story. What a turnaround story that would be to root for. I'm not saying it's absolutely going to happen, but the fact that he's been running exclusively as the number one left tackle so far through training camp, I think let me tell you something, because TJ Woods came in, essentially uh, wiped the slate clean and said, everybody has to earn their jobs. And 
Caleb Etienne apparently has done enough to earn that trust so far in training camp. So those are the four names so far in training camp that I'm looking at that I've been impressed by. Ethan Erickson at tight end, Sione Moa at linebacker, Mori Bomba at cornerback, and Caleb Etienne at offensive tackle. And I'm sure there'll be more names to pop up, and I'll check in with you guys on a regular basis and share those names. But those are the ones, I guess, through essentially about a week's worth of camp that have stood out to me. All right, we'll finish up today's show with a look at some news on the BYU basketball front. Is it really as simple as Kevin Young talking to one person one time to inject BYU into a conversation for an elite talent? Well, if you believe one player's father, apparently that's, that is the case, and we'll talk about that next right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay, with eBay guaranteed fit, excuse me, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home those huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Once again, eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. If you have not done so already, what are you doing? Join us our Locked On Cougars insider group. We've had a really nice uptick in membership uh, of late. Click the link. Whether you're watching this on YouTube, you're listening to it on whatever podcast platform of choice, there is a link in the show notes below. If you've not signed up today, I am sending you guys updates when I'm out of BYU football practice, and they're coming to you in the form of a text message. It does not get that much uh, more direct. You're not having to go to a message board or log into a website to get the updates. They're coming to you in the form of a text message you see them you can respond we have one-on-one -on -one conversations and the best part is you get a 14-day free trial you got two weeks you can essentially get the full uh length of the rest of training camp to see if it's the right option for you and just five dollars a month afterwards this is uh cheap as you're going to find for an insider's group it feels like out there i want to encourage you guys to join us today all right before we go on today's show we got to talk about byu basketball for a minute now adam zagoria uh writes for zag's blog he's his own uh, blog out there he covers college basketball and college basketball recruiting in depth now caleb wilson is part of the 2025 recruiting cycle and he along with aj debonsa are two of the elite talents in the next recruiting uh, cycle in college basketball if you want an example of that aj debonsa is the top rated prospect in the 2024 uh 20 uh, 24 seven recruiting rankings with a 100 rating. He has a perfect rating from 24 seven sports. Caleb Wilson right behind him with a 99 rating. Now, Caleb Wilson on July 31st uh, put out a top 12 of the likes of Arkansas, Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina. Uh, let's see, Auburn, Alabama, USE, Oregon, Tennessee. Like, we're talking the who's who of college basketball. We're in his top 12. Well, Adam Zagoria tweeted this just yesterday. Uh, August 5th came out at 11.08 a.m. Mountain Time. Said this. Five-star jumbo wing Caleb Wilson, which by the way, uh, Wilson is a six foot nine wing player. Think a guy kind of in the mold of like those supersized wings like BYU has with Jaeger Denim, by the way. And Jaeger Denim just got a five-star rating from uh 24-7 sports with a 98 rating uh coming up in this 2024 recruiting cycle. It is put BYU, I believe, in the top 10 in terms of the recruiting class, just incredible things. But uh, Caleb Wilson's uh, father said this, uh, telling Adam Zagoria, they had a Zoom meeting with BYU basketball, and ostensibly that would be Kevin Young and some of his assistant coach. Uh, Caleb Wilson's father said this, quote, it was amazing, and quote, they have definitely put themselves in the real conversation, unquote. Now, did he put out a new revised top 12 or top 13, speaking of Caleb Wilson? Not to my knowledge, but I'm telling you, Kevin Young is proving Time and time again, that the second he gets or an opportunity, the, the first opportunity he has to talk to a player or a prospect's family, he is just must be absolute dynamite with his ability to go into these meetings. I told you guys we had Travis Hansen on shortly after Jaeger Denim uh, committed to the BYU basketball program. And uh, he had a connection to the Denim family, having played in Russia and all that stuff. And Hansen said that he was absolutely floored and blown away with the way that Kevin Young approached things. 
Kevin Young has an ability to connect with players that belies a lot of what we've talked about with his recruiting style. There's a reason why guys like Joel Embiid, Devin Booker, Chris Paul, et cetera, in the NBA, trust him implicitly. He has these guys on speed dial. There have been multiple reports that during recruiting visits, like the one with AJ DeBonson not that long ago, uh, he reportedly, speaking of Kevin Young, called up Chris Paul and had him talk to AJ DeBonson about what Kevin Young uh, has meant for his career. Kevin Young's ability to develop talent, A, and B, develop relationships is really, really unique. And I'm not saying that BYU is going to find themselves all of a sudden in a recruiting battle yet again with Caleb Wilson, because like I said, he, he announced the top 12 that didn't have BYU in it uh, back at the end of the last month. But just a week later, quote, speaking of BYU, they have definitely put themselves in the real conversation, unquote, after a Zoom meeting. I, I don't want to say that Kevin Young, everything he touched, tur touches, is, tur turns to gold. But man, this guy, I, I, I would love to be sitting in one of these meetings, whether it's a Zoom meeting or going into a prospect's home, just to get a feel for how Kevin Young approaches this. Every coach has ways that they approach different things. There are coaches who like to boast their resume of, I've been to this many Final Fours, i got national championships in my back pocket, I've developed this many All-Americans, I've put this many guys in the NBA, blah, 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 blah. Kevin Young doesn't have any of that right now at the college basketball level. What he has is a proven track record in the NBA of being a talent uh, developer and evaluator, and he's bringing that to the college game. In time, should he have success, he will finally be able to have those conversations with prospects and say, yes, I've developed, let's say, Jaeger Denham and Cannon Catchings are now in the NBA, or if you land, a, a, in this case, an A.J. DeBonsa and or a Caleb Wilson, and they have gone on to great things in the NBA. That stuff will come in time. But the fact that he doesn't have that track record, and he reportedly is able to get BYU into the conversation with some of the biggest talents in literally all of college basketball, it's frankly astounding to me what Kevin Young is doing right now. I, I can't express what it is just, it's like watching and, and covering this and trying to make heads and tails of it all. But I'll just say this. It's absolutely awesome because if BYU basketball become a big deal in college hoops and really find themselves competing amongst the nation's elite. I'm totally okay with that. I'm actually going to pull my phone out here. It reminds me of a tweet I saw uh, earlier today. I've got to pull this up as I'm talking. But the biggest thing I think for a BYU is I know that losing a coach the caliber of Mark Pope was considered to be like, quote unquote, a death knell for the BYU basketball program because he went to Kentucky. And a lot of people thought, okay, what in the world just happened? And what's BYU going to do to respond? Well, in so many ways, BYU has responded absolutely in kind, and if not uh, upgrading their overall profile, because as Kyle Tucker from The Athletic says this, future 30 for 30, what if I told you the SMU fired a good coach, which gave Andy Enfield an escape from USC, which gave Eric Musselman an escape from Arkansas, which gave John Calipari an escape from Kentucky, which brought Mark Pope home, which turned BYU into an NIL behemoth. Not saying it's going to be a documentary, but that seems like a pretty good pitch for a very, very good a 30 for 30, considering we have to see if BYU has the success on the court that matches what they've done on the recruiting front. Kevin Young is absolutely killing it. I, I can't sing his praises enough. I, people I talk to that know him far better than I do just can't say enough good things about him and what he is doing for BYU basketball. And he's got a, a, a drive to be great. And that is awesome for BYU. And I'm not saying that Mark Pope didn't have a drive because Mark absolutely put on for BYU, but in so many ways, Kevin Young has taken essentially what Mark Pope laid the groundwork for going into the big 12 and the success they had year one. And he's only elevated it. We'll see if it pays off in the 2025 recruiting cycle. If the likes of a Caleb Wilson and or AJ DeBonsa pick BYU basketball, but if it takes one conversation via Zoom, via video chat for Kevin Young to inject BYU into the conversation with yet another top 10 talent in the college basketball world, man, what can he accomplish if he starts to have a track record of success over the next couple of or couple or few seasons? It just feels like things could really, really start rolling in a big way for BYU basketball. And they really already feel like uh, they're well on their way in terms of the momentum uh, going in favor of the Cougars. So there you go. That's what I've got for you guys on this. Uh, it's a Tuesday. Wow. I, I'm, I'm Tuesday, Wednesday. I don't, no, regardless. 
Big thank you to all of you for uh, making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. As I often say, thank you for being every dayers with us right here on the podcast. And until tomorrow, everybody, have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast.